I'd like to turn to this morning's topic, uh, which is military space activities. Over the last few years, we have increased, heard very much increased concern from many countries about the militarization and even weaponization of space. Space capabilities are playing a bigger role in military power and national security, and multiple countries have been developing the ability to deny, degrade, or even destroy someone else's space capabilities. These include ground-based and space-based anti-satellite weapons, high-powered lasers, radio frequency jamming, and cyber attacks. From SWF's perspective, we have been tracking the proliferation of these counter-space capabilities through our annual global counter-space capabilities report, which is available on our website. As a result of these growing threats and the increased importance of space for military uses, there has been a more public discussion about what to do about these threats from senior political and military leaders around the world. Here in the United States, these discussions have led to a significant reorganization of military space activities, which has included the creation of the US Space Force and the resurrection of US Space Command. But the US has not been the only country grappling these issues, as several different countries around the world have all been looking at how they should respond to increasing space threats with organizational policy and strategy changes of their own. So with that bit of background, I'd like to introduce uh, a panel of uh, international military leaders who are joining me to take about these issues. And if I can ask all my panelists to please go ahead and turn on uh, their audio and video. Uh, these leaders have all been deeply involved in grappling with these issues of space security and dealing with threats and challenges in their own countries uh, and implementing changes to try and address those threats. So I'd first like to introduce Major General John Shaw, uh, who has served as a US Space Force operations professional for nearly 30 years uh, and currently wears two hats, one as the Combined Force Space Component Commander for US Space Command, and the other is Commander of US Space Operations Command in the US Space Force. And I think we're gonna have a chance to talk a little bit more about what those two different hats are as we go along here. Um, I'd also like to introduce uh, Major General uh, Michel Friedling, uh, he's a distinguished French Air Force pilot and a strategist who currently serves as the commander of the recently created French Joint Space Command. We also have Major General Hiroki Sakanashi, who has had a long career in cybersecurity and C4 systems with the Japan Air Self-Defense Force and currently serves as Director General of the Project Promotion Group for Emerging Domains and Programs, as well as Vice Commandant Air Command and Staff College at the Air Staff Office for the Joint Air Self-Defense Force. And finally, we have Brigadier General Michael Adamson, uh, who is a career navigator with the Royal Canadian Air Force and recently uh, been chosen to be the Director General and Component Commander of Space at National Defense Headquarters. We're going to run this, this, this session as a conversation and, and hopefully an interesting one. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, please go ahead and drop that into the question and answer, um, and I will be incorporating those uh, into our discussion as we go along. So I think we'll get started just by talking about what is happening uh, in the space domain that is driving a lot of this discussion. Uh, and uh, General Shaw, if you don't mind, I think I'll start with you. Um, what have you seen in, in the changes in the space threat landscape over the last few years? And how would you compare it to, let's say, you know, 20 years ago? So uh, good morning, Brian, and good morning to uh, all those watching today. Uh, good morning from the central coast of California here at Vandenberg Air Force Base. And, and let me also say it's an honor to be on this panel with some terrific teammates that you've already introduced. And, and uh, I'm happy to be here. You know, Brian, I think I, I think if you don't mind, I'd like to, I think for proper context, let me, let me widen your, your question to not just the threat landscape, what's happened in space uh, that now uh, has probably has driven what we see as threats within the space domain. So, you know, we're, we're approaching the 63rd anniversary of Sputnik here in a couple of weeks, uh, 63 years, not a long time. Um, and uh, I think we could ask the question, what will historians write about human activity in the space domain, say in 2057, looking back 100 years? And I think that they will write that what humans did in the space domain mirrored what they did in other domains um, as they progressed. It started with exploration, 
then it started with state only activity and then rapidly expanded to civil activity, academic activity, commercial activity. We saw this, I think, in history in the maritime domain. We could say the same has happened in a much more compressed timeline in the cyber domain. And it's in that context that uh, as things evolve, that there now becomes in that domain, as humans uh, uh, have more activity in that domain, there is mischief and, and outright threats. And I think in some ways, it's, we'll see, we will look back on it and say this was a natural evolution of humans expanding into the domain in all kinds of activities. And so what, we, um, what we've seen more recently, we tend to point to 2007, the Chinese ASAT as an inflection point, but what we've seen is a steady drumbeat of, of uh, threats increasing. You've, uh, you've uh, already mentioned a few of those uh, in the last uh, 13 years. Um, and most recently, even just within the last couple of years, Russia in particular has shown a wide spectrum of threats uh, that, that they are uh, developing and fielding. Uh, you could talk to some of our commercial partners about concerns of Russian satellites in geo that might qualify as the mischief piece that uh, I mentioned. And then even in, within the last year, we've seen uh, in April a, uh, a, a Russian ASAT test from the ground into LEO. And even more recently, we've seen activity in low Earth orbit uh, with a Russian satellite shadowing a U.S. government satellite, and then later on, uh, launching what appears to be an on-orbit uh, satellite, anti-satellite test. And this particular test involved the, uh, the uh, ejection of a projectile from uh, a Russian satellite. We had seen a similar test in 2017. We saw it again in July. Uh, the Russian explanation with that was that that projectile was an inspection satellite, but that doesn't match what we saw. They called it, uh, if you, if you uh, saw a ship at sea uh, launch a projectile at relative high speed to the launch platform in a relatively straight line uh, and didn't do much maneuvering, I'm not sure you would call that an inspection ship. You would probably call that a torpedo. And that's exactly what I believe we observed the Russians testing was a space torpedo. Uh, I could add uh, uh, many other threats that we've seen along the continuum of uh, of space, of counter space capabilities, the pro proliferation of, of uh, electromagnetic spectrum jammers, directed energy. And uh, we, what we have done, I think, is respond uh, to those developments in order to protect our space capabilities that we rely on, not only for national security means, but also for economic prosperity. Um, I think I'll, I'll finish my, my stand by saying, you know, that you're, uh, your title of this panel is, is a good one. I think everybody wants a space force. And so I think a fundamental question could be why do so many nations now want a space force? And I would, I would propose that the answer is analogous to why do uh, ocean going or spacefaring nations want a Navy? Uh, it is to secure that domain for all activity and to deter threats in that domain. Nobody wants a war on the high seas. Nobody wants a war in space. And I think we are all uh, looking to this domain as, as, a, as extremely important to the future of, of humans. And I think the development of space forces is a natural evolution in that regard. Thanks. Yeah, no, I, thank you for that. that that's a great per, uh, opening perspective on this. Um, General Friedling, I, I wonder if you could maybe expand on that and sort of provide the French perspective of what, you, what you've been seeing over the last few years that has sort of driven this, this discussion in, in France and in Europe more broadly. Uh, good morning, uh, Brian, and good morning to everybody uh, watching and listening this this panel. Uh, I, I'm not sure I could extend uh, uh, what, what brilliantly said the uh, general show. Uh, we uh, we share the same concerns. We say we share the same uh, the same statements about what what is happening in space. So uh, we are fully uh, in line with these uh, uh, these uh, words. Uh, um, so our answer was, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the our new uh, space defense strategy that we released in 2019. Um, the impulsion, the impulse came from from the president himself, saying that space was a, a matter of, uh, of uh, national security, like cyber, and we already had a cyber command. We didn't have any uh, space command or something appropriate to uh, to face these challenges. 
so uh, we worked for one year um, uh, under the direction of our Ministry of Armed Forces, Mrs. Florence Parly, and, uh, and 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 we made actually we made the same statements uh, that uh, uh, General Shaw described very very well. And uh, first of all, and I, I don't want to state the obvious, but uh, first of all, the crucial importance of space, not only for uh, for uh, defense uh, purposes, but only but also for the daily functioning of our societies and for the, the economic prosperity. Uh, and, and, this, uh, and from a military perspective, these services are really crucial uh, to our uh, self-sufficiency in terms of decision-making and for our military operations. So the second statement was the, you know, the upheaval of the world space ecosystem. Uh, with the, uh, the, you know, the democratization of access to space, with the appearance of many, many actors, non-government actors in space, commercial projects, and the congestion of space. And uh, finally, the last statement was uh, the vulnerability of space activities and infrastructure. And, and, and very recently, all the events that uh, John Shaw described very well again, uh, we, we have seen them and we are really concerned about them. So this is the reason why we decided to, uh, to release this strategy. And uh, there are four axes in this strategy, I, I would say. The first one is a new doctrine for military space operations. Uh, and, and specifically, the, the main point of this new doctrine is uh, the ability to, uh, to uh, detect, characterize, and, and respond to any hostile or uh, non-responsible action against our space interests. The, the second axis was a new capability ambition. So capabilities to be able to do that. And, uh, and so we are working on this uh, quite, uh, quite hard. The third axis was to, um, to change the governance, the organization of the Ministry of Defense uh, by creating a new command dedicated to space and in order to, um, to be much more efficient uh, face, to face these threats. And the fourth axis uh, was to develop and to increase the space expertise in the Ministry of Defense to be able to achieve these missions. Oh, that's, that's excellent. And I think a little, uh, a little bit later in this discussion, I would, I'd like to unpack some of those and talk about you know, some of the details because I think those are challenges that I think all four of you are trying to address. How do you deal with capabilities how do you deal with protection? How do you deal with expertise? Um, so, so General Sakanashi, I'll turn to you now um, and sort of ask from, from the perspective of Japan, uh, do, do, you, do you see a similar challenges as, as to what, you know, what General Shaw and General Friedling talked about? Um, uh, what is your view on what is changing in the space domain? Uh, basically, uh, how we see the uh, security environment uh, in the space domain is uh, 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 just uh, just as uh, uh, Major Show and Major Friedling said, and the uh, security environment uh, surrounding Japan uh, is uh, uh, changing uh, at extremely high speed, and uh, 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 so uh, <clears throat> changes in the balance of power in the, in the international arena accelerating and becoming more complex, and uh, uncertainty over. The existing order is increasing. And in addition, the rapid expansion uh, uh, in the use of uh, a new domains such as uh, space uh, uh, is a poise to fundamentally change the existing pa paradigm of uh, national security. So uh, uh, we, we regard the, the space security threat is a very uh, serious uh, uh, problem. And, uh, and uh, one more point is uh, uh, the sense of space and also the cyber domains are widely used for civilian purpose, purposes. So if a stable use of the, these domains is impeded, uh, it may entail a serious uh, consequences for the safety of the state and uh, the citizens. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, from the uh, international 
perspective is uh, in the uh, international community that there is uh, uh, broadening and diversifying array, array of security challenges that cannot be dealt with by a single country alone. And so uh, the space security challenges is a uh, very uh, <laughs> typical uh, example for, for the security challenge. That's all I have. Mm. No, that's excellent. Thank you. Um, so, so General Amundsen, turning it over to you now. I think you know a lot of people are very familiar with with with, uh, with Canada's civil space program and you know, the amazing uh, Canada arm you guys had first on the shuttle and now on the Inner Space Station. Maybe a little bit less familiar with what Canada's military activity has been in space. Can you kind of talk about the the history of that and sort of what Canada's military has been thinking about space and and how that may have been changing. Certainly. Uh, and first of all, I'd just like to uh, thank you for including me on this panel as well. It certainly uh, is a delight for me to be here with this, such an auspicious group. Um, Canada, obviously, as you mentioned, uh, has a long history of, uh, of space activities uh, going back to our initially our Annex satellite uh, uh, years and years ago in, in the space arm. From a, a military perspective, though, there's been a growing awareness within the, uh, the Canadian defense uh, community and the government, certainly, of the importance uh, that military space is playing in the, in the overall picture, um, maintaining access to the, uh, to the space commons, um, maintaining uh, mission assuredness. And so as a result of that, uh, we published a defense policy in 2017 that really clearly articulates that recognized uh, importance of the space domain to all of our activities from a military standpoint, uh, but also how clearly they are interlinked with what we're doing on a civil and commercial uh, situation as well. So that policy uh, basically provides us uh, the, the starting point from which we're moving forward and trying to expand and grow our military operations in space. Um, we've had a longstanding relationship uh, with the U.S., obviously working alongside in, in the NORAD domain. Um, and then we're expanding uh, our, our alliance framework, if you will, through the Combined Space Operations uh, Alliance and, uh, and working uh, you know, as NATO develops uh, an awareness of the space domain as well. Uh, working with our alliances there. So really keeping that military interaction piece with the alliances, understanding that uh, very few nations um, can go it alone. Canada always recognizes the importance of that alliance structure. Um, so we're trying to find those capabilities that we can bring to bear that contribute to the overall um, awareness picture. So whether it be um, our Sapphire system, which contributes to awareness of of space domain, um, or whether or not it be our radar stack constellation, which is providing a little bit of uh, maritime domain awareness. Um, and obviously there are other areas that we want to be uh, up to speed and, and experts in as well, such as uh, global communications and specifically polar communications. So the military is, is looking at those capabilities, those that we have, and the ones that we want to, uh, you know, to continue to have and bring forward, but you know what that means in the context of our alliances as well to make sure that we're a, a partner with everyone else that uh, that we're doing that with. Oh, great, thank you. Um, so I think each of you mentioned that the, the these challenges you've been experiencing have driven changes in your own countries, and I want to kind of go through it and touch on those a little more uh, significantly and talk about what those are. So I think General Shaw, I'll start with you because probably been the most written and the most kind of public awareness about the recent changes in the U.S. Um, you just briefly, for, for those people that may have not have been entirely following what's been happening, there's been a lot <laughs> in the last uh, year and a half or so, to sort of recap what has happened in the U.S. and what are the big changes that have been. Sure, Brian, I, and I'm there. you're right. So much has happened. I'm sure I will miss some big pieces uh, <laughs> just in the interest of time, but I'll start with U.S. Space Force, uh, again, uh, approaching nine months, only nine months ago that the United States Space Force was formed, and already we've made some tremendous progress. And uh, I, would, I would point to, uh, again, my opening remarks of uh, the creation of the United States Space Force was not only necessary, but it was inevitable. As we were going to further security interests in the space domain, it becomes natural that you would have a service dedicated to providing the capabilities and most importantly, the people, the expertise to provide security in that domain. And uh, we continue to, uh, uh, General Raymond as our first chief of space operations uh, has led us through some tremendous progress already in less than nine months in terms of reorganization, bringing people into the space force and uh, and prioritizing the development of capabilities for that force. 
Then the other, that's one large planet, uh, new planet in the, in, the, in the solar system. Another is, as you mentioned before, United States Space Command. Brian, you used the verb uh, um, uh, uh, resurrected. resurrection, I think, or resurrected. Uh, I, I think I would throw out maybe reincarnation might be a better word, although we could probably find an even better word than either of those, because it is not the United States Space Command of uh, 1985 to 2002. Uh, this is a command that's now addressing a much wider spectrum of threats, and in some, in many ways, uh, General Dickinson, as the United States Space Command, right, will be a supported commander in future activities uh, as we uh, conduct all domain operations in future in future conflicts. Um, and as you, and again, as you introduced me, I, I actually wear hats in either in both of those organizations, and uh, it's been quite a uh, a, quite an interesting uh, experience for me to see us evolve both of those organizations. A couple other pieces, though. Um, one other thing that we did within the last year is we stood up the, we converted what was the Joint Force Space Component Command to the Combined Force Space Component Command. And over my left shoulder, you'll see the, the patch that has that word combined in it. I'm very proud of that in my duty title because it it links to what you've, I've already heard a couple of my colleagues saying, and I'm sure we'll talk more about, is that uh, it, it means an alliance. It means that we work together as allies and partners to secure the space domain, and I'm happy to be part of that. I would also say it's not just the Department of Defense. We've seen some movement in other sectors as well, and I think that, for example, uh, I think we will see very soon here the Department of Commerce taking on a larger role with regard to space situational awareness and space and complementing uh, Department of Defense activities on space domain awareness. And so it continues to, to broaden, it continues to materialize, and I think we'll see much more happening in the next couple of years uh, at the same pace that we've already seen the last, last couple of years. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's actually excellent point. And, and your point about the combined, I think that's, that's one of those uh, military terms that I think the general public may not be entirely uh, aware of, but you know, 15 years ago, I was part of the joint Space Operations Center, which implied that it was joint across the different services, Army, Air Force, Navy, Marines. And then, as you said recently, that's been changed to combined, which in military lingo means not just joint, but also bringing in other countries, those allies and those, those even those commercial partners, that, which I think we'll also talk about a little bit further on the conversation. Um, just, just quickly to go back to General Shaw again. Um, can you kind of delineate what the difference is between your responsibilities with your Space Force hat and your Space Command hat? Yeah, thanks, Brian, for the opportunity. So I think there's still some confusion in our general American public about U.S. Space Force versus United States Space Command. And I would point to this. This is how we organize as a Department of Defense in all domains. We have services, and that would be the United States Space Force analogous to the United States Air Force or the Navy or the Army that organize, train, and equip, and present capability, right? They're the ones that build the equipment, that train the warfighters, and then present that capability for a fight. Those are services. Combatant commands, of which United States Space Command is the 11th of all of the combatant commands in the, in the Department of Defense, and others would include Northern Command or Strategic Command or Cent Central Command, CENTCOM, that might be a little bit more familiar to, to folks uh, in the American public. Those are actually the warfighters. It's how we fight as a joint force with multiple services and, uh, and use those capabilities that the services have, have developed uh, in operations. And so part of my job is overseeing the service side of our, uh, of our, of our space capabilities um, and ensuring that we're training our folks properly and that we're bringing on capability properly and are operating it uh, eff effectively. And then in my joint hat, we actually operate those capabilities for the benefit of joint warfighters. If someone in the uh, Indo-Pacific region or in the Europe, or in European command needs uh, satellite communications or needs uh, uh, other uh, or, or missile warning capability, then it's in my joint hat that I ensure that that capability is there uh, for those warfighters. I, so I hope that helps differentiate between, between those two. But I would point again, that is how we do things in the Department of Defense. It's not unique. It is actually normalized to how we do things in other domains and across the planet. Great, thank you. Um, so, so General Friedling, I'd like to turn to you and sort of uh, give you a chance to expand on what you mentioned earlier. So we just heard from General Shaw 
the organizational changes in the U.S. and and the, and the U.S. is, I'll say, is different than other countries. Demand the U.S. military tends to have a lot more forces and a lot bigger of an organization. And so this is their approach in these two separate organizations. Can you expand a little bit on sort of what France's approach in the past was to military space and what this new change of this new Joint Command really means? Okay. Uh, obviously, this is uh, very different from uh, from the U.S. Uh, although we have some some you know some kind of similarities between between two countries, and I will uh, explain them. Uh, first of all, you know, this morning I was I was uh, uh, with the media, the French media, because tomorrow tomorrow we will have a military ceremony with the chief of the Air Force at the Ministry of Defense, uh, Mrs. Parley. And uh, because uh, we, the, the French Air Force is, is now named French Air and Space Force. So we, we kind of have a Space Force too, I would say. But, <laughs> but so this morning I was with the media and, 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 and I explained a little bit the history of, of space in France and, and the Ministry of Defense. And actually it started in 1947. And between 1947 and 1962, uh, in Algeria, which was French at that time, we had the first uh, spaceport, uh, I would say, uh, French spaceport. And this is the place where the French Air Force and, uh, you know, the ancestor of what is today the French procurement agency, the DGA, and the ancestor was it, of what is today the French space agency. All these together, they, they, uh, they uh, developed uh, the French, uh, first French rockets to, uh, to go to space. And uh, this is amazing because this is today what we do. We, we work with the same people, the French Air Force, uh, the French DGA, and the French Space Agency. So this was a long time ago. Uh, I would say in the uh, around 19, in the mid 90s, late 90s, we created within the Air Force, the French Air Force, two units. Uh, one dedicated to the, uh, the control of the uh, uh, observation satellites. Another one dedicated to the uh, space surveillance. They were belonging to the, for, to the French Air Force. And in 2010, 10 years ago, uh, we created a, a, a so-called Joint Space Command. But my opinion is it was everything but a command. It was uh, it got a kind of departments within the joint staff in Paris. Only 40 people there in charge of the military space policy. This is what the way we call it in France. It means uh, procurement programs, space capabilities, um, corporations, uh, and so on. And, and all the operational units were belonging to the Air Force. And during the, uh, you know, the uh, space review uh, last year, we figured out that uh, this organization was not consistent, was not efficient, was not visible. And we decided to create a single organization and to put uh, together within this organization all the different units and people in charge of any aspect of the space domain, either in the joint uh, staff or in the Air Force. And this command is, is very small, actually. It's not like, like in the US. It's very small. It's, uh, today, it's uh, a little bit less than 300 people. It will be 50, 500 people in a three-year time. So we grow up. and. Uh, and, and it's, it's a kind of unique and hybrid command because it's at the same time in charge of the military space policy, so military capabilities, uh, corporations in the space domain. Uh, it's also in charge of uh, creating the space expertise, recruiting and training people. It's also in charge of its kind of operational command because it's in charge of uh, uh, conducting uh, some uh, space operations. So, and the other point is that it's a joint command, and this is a crucial point. This is, this is a joint command, but within the Air Force. And, and I would say this is a kind of similarity that we have with the US, because in, in the US, you have created the Space Force, so a dedicated service, but within the Department of the, of the Air Force. And this is somehow a kind of similarity, because we have a joint command dedicated to the space domain, but within the Air Force, and so it's both joint and air. Mm -hmm. Well, that's excellent, thank you. Um, so, so General Sakanashi, I'd like to turn to you. Uh, so Japan is also making quite a lot of changes. You talked about them 
a, a little bit, but that, that starts with sort of a, a different thinking about the Japanese, the role of the Japanese military in space, which was new. Um, and you've also made some organizational changes recent, very recently. Can, can you talk a little bit more about what these changes in Japan have been over the last, let's say, 10 years with regard to the military in space and the new organization? So, uh, uh, um, uh, basically, uh, uh, the uh, Japan has a, a long history uh, uh, for uh, uh, basically banning the military uh, s uh, space activities, and uh, uh, only uh, uh, JAXA uh, is an uh, active uh, space uh, uh, entity, and uh, but. Uh, 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 we uh, changed the law, and uh, we uh, uh, the the Jap uh, government of Japan uh, the uh, finalized the uh, national uh, uh, defense program guideline in, in, in uh, uh, for uh, fiscal year 2019 and beyond, and uh, in, in in that uh, the uh, uh, so uh, creating. Uh, uh, the space unit uh, is uh, uh, decided. So uh, uh, in this year, the 2020, the, uh, in Japan uh, Airship Defense Force, uh, we have a very uh, first uh, a space dedicated uh, military unit, uh, which called uh, Space Operations Squadron, the, which is a uh, uh, small, uh, approximately uh, uh, 20 uh, personnel and uh, uh, so far poorly uh, equipped, but uh, very it's, uh, epoch making and uh, very uh, uh, huge uh, uh, leap uh, forward for uh, Japan Safe Defense Force. Uh, so uh, uh, 20, uh, 20 is a very stretching year for us. Excellent. Um, so General Adam Adamson, um, again, I think, you know, could give you a second to expand a little bit more on if there's been any recent changes uh, in, in the way Canada's approaching space. But also something we haven't really talked about yet is uh, the Combined Space Operations Initiative. Uh, and I know Canada has been playing a role in that. So if you could talk about that a little bit, well, I think that would be very useful. Certainly. So um, from a Canadian perspective, uh, we are certainly, like most nations, uh, going through an evolutionary process in our organization, um, probably not to the same extent as what we see in the U.S. with the uh, creation of Space Force, but a very similar alignment of, uh, of our organization and how we're structured. Um, up until a few years ago, um, sort of a nascent space capability was nested within our vice chief organization uh, with the original standup of, of Director General Space as there's been increased awareness and recognition of the importance of uh, the military space aspects. Um, a few years ago, with the release of our new space, po or our new sorry, uh, defense policy, uh, we underwent some organizational changes as well. Um, it was felt that uh, the importance of space demanded that it really needed to sort of move out of that sort of offices within the vice's organization and really head over to the Air Force where it could be shepherded with the, the full scope and, and uh, benefits of that, uh, that structure. We've done that. We've moved uh, space sort of underneath the commander of the RCAF, the Royal Canadian Air Force. Um, but as a result of that, have been able to leverage the Air Force writ large in things like moving projects forward, interacting with industry, uh, and that kind of thing. So now the, the Air Force is responsible for space across um, the entire spectrum of operations. Um, as a result of that, my position really has, has become dual-hatted as well. So within the Air Force, I'm Director General of Air, uh, sorry, space rather, um, which uh, you know has a an administrative and, and bureaucratic function to it. Um, on the other side, I'm also the uh, space component commander, um, responding to our operational command. So, as we do with with other air platforms, whether it be air mobilities or, or fighter or what have you, uh, the air force is responsible for generating forces to make sure we've got the you know the air crews and the capabilities. Um, and then when time comes to employ those forces, they are chopped over to the operational command then to employ whatever they might need. Uh, and space is now no different than that. The Air Force is responsible for generating those forces uh, and shepherding them and, uh, and handling the projects and procurement aspects. Uh, and then we take that in a force employment perspective and, and chop that over to our operational command. Um, as we continue to evolve that even further, 
we're looking at basically mirroring organizationally and doctrinally what the Air Force is about. Um, so in that respect, we have air divisions uh, that have got uh, the air power that are generated uh, and then and then handed to operational command for employment. Um, and so similarly, we're exploring the possibility of, of shifting yet again and, uh, and looking at perhaps a space division with associated wings uh, that would generate the forces that would then go off and, and work with the operational command. So it continues to evolve. Um, and, and does so reactive to the environment that we're operating in. You know, it's important, I guess, that we sort of observe what those required interactions are going to be internal to the Canadian Armed Forces and the joint aspects, um, but also make sure that we are able to react and interact um, with our partners. And you mentioned the combined space operations as well. Um, that is a, a large portion of what we do. Um, and in no small part, we organize ourselves to make sure that we remain interoperable. For instance, within our operational side, we've got the Canadian Space Operations Center, the CANSPOC, um, which is uh, you know, on a smaller scale, mirrors what the uh, Space Operations Center within the US is doing. Um, and we've got a lot of, uh, of ties with that organization and with the other CSPO partners and their operations center as well to, uh, to make sure that we can you know, back up what is being done. Um, I think it creates a level of redundancy, uh, which also creates resiliency, which as you know, is extremely important uh, in military operations. And so I think that that really importantly shapes how we're moving forward and evolving our organization as well. Yeah, it's been interesting to kind of follow the evolution of that. Um, you think back, uh, it was the 2010 Shriver War Game exercise, this notion of a combined space operations center that brought in partner, ally partners and commercial partners. And it's been over the last 10 years, sort of the uh, a sh a, a ongoing shift um, in, in trying to bring at least part of that vision uh, around. And then of course, now today we have not only the, the CSPO, which is what you mentioned, which is sort of the, how do we talk across different countries, space operator centers, but also the combined space operator center now exists out at, out at Vandenberg, um, which I think is a pretty interesting, you know, the military is a big bureaucracy, right? It takes a little time to make some changes, but it's it's been it's been interesting watching some of these changes um, over time. Um, General Adamson, you just talk quickly about. Um, I think it was General Fridley mentioned earlier about the need for for training and sort of building a cadre. Um, you know, I, I introduced you as a, as a navigator because traditionally that's sort of been one of the main sources of space expertise. Can you talk about kind of the evolution of the of the you know? because you don't have a specific space career field as far as I understand it in Canada, or do you? We don't actually. And, and that's a bit of a function of our size. You know, I don't think we have the ability at the meal at the moment to, to dedicate an entire uh, occupation stream uh, just to space operations. That said, we do have occupations within the air force and, and the army and the Navy um, that have over time, really been the go-to occupations when it comes to, you know, engaging with, with space operations um, for a number of reasons. Um, and, and those occupations, uh, air weapons controllers, for instance, within the Canadian Air Force, uh, air combat systems officers, which is what we've renamed our navigators, um, folks with that air domain awareness um, that, that are used to uh, operating in that environment and have relied uh, a great deal on, on space capabilities as a consumer uh, in their operational fields are, uh, are folks that have, have demonstrated interest in that and have gravitated towards the, uh, the space employment. Um, for us, it remains uh, a bit of an attraction issue for us. So, you know, we want to obviously um, let the rest of the Canadian Armed Forces know what is going on in the space domain. Um, we want to attract not just Air Force officers, but it is joint. So we want to make sure that we include uh, the Navy, uh, the Army, and the Special Ops folks. Um, and, and we do have those folks seated within our organization as well. We are very much a joint organization. I don't know that we will get to a point where we have a, an occupation specific to space, but it's something certainly we could aspire to and then something that quite possibly uh, may manifest itself down the road. Um, but in the, in the meantime, we have a cadre of folks that will sort of come in and out of that space sphere. Um, come in, they'll do some time within the space realm, perhaps go back to a parent community, um, you, you know, go move along in their career, come back at the next rank level. And, and our hope is, as we continue to grow the enterprise, um, that a future, you know, replacement for me, a future DG space, uh, will somebody that has spent their entire career sort of moving in and out of that space sphere um, and is intimately familiar with, 
the um, the work and the challenges that are out there, and uh, and has got a Rolodex full of uh, of folks that uh, you know are, are equally interested in that kind of thing as well. So it's aspirationally, it's where we'd like to go. Um, we're we're getting there slowly. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to start pulling in some of the audience questions now. And General Friedling, one of them is to you, and it asks this question about whether or not there may be a, a, a EU space command, or, or in more broadly, what do you see as the, the coordination at the EU level on some of these uh, uh, space issues? Um, and, and I guess I'll add into that, um, NATO has also recently uh, announced the new NATO space policy. I don't know if you can talk about that at all as well. Um, regarding EU, uh, well, there are, there are um, works being done about, you know, space surveillance, at least for civilian purposes, uh, for, you know, SST or SSA. There are many questions about uh, um, collision avoidance, uh, debris, and so space, space surveillance uh, to avoid risks in space. Uh, we are, it's a long shot to have discussions for a uh, kind of military European space, um, space uh, surveillance center. And uh, so right now we are more trying to build national capabilities and to coordinate with allied in Europe. And uh, it's not a secret to say that we work with Germany we work with Italy and uh, we, we also start to work with Spain to build something, you know, in Europe uh, and, and to provide Europe with some capabilities. Regarding NATO, um, uh, I think everybody knows that uh, uh, NATO declared the space domain as an operational domain end of 2019. So this is, uh, this is now a big very new, the latest domain for NATO, and, and again, uh, there are uh, thinkings in the NATO on the way to address this new domain. And uh, this is uh, now the point for me to, to say that France has proposed uh, to host and, uh, and uh, uh, a, a center of excellence for space uh, for NATO in, uh, in Toulouse, where we will uh, set up our uh, uh, space command and the space operational center, um, and and Toulouse, which is actually the the largest uh, space hub in Europe. So this is the place where the, the 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 largest space expertise is in Europe. So we think it's a very good idea for NATO to have a dedica dedicated space center of excellence. Uh, to this new domain and to uh, locate this uh, center in Toulouse where the space expertise is. So it's so easy to cross the street and to have all the space experts. So it's a, this is the proposal of France for, for, the, for NATO. Great, thank you. Um, so General Shaw, question for you. Uh, we've used the phrase space as a domain, a separate domain operation several times now. Um, one of the, the questions in the chat is, where does that begin? Um, so where, and I think this was addressed in the recent um, capstone document that the Space Force put out. So if you could talk about sort of how you guys are seeing where the, the delineation between the space domain and other domains are and, and how you're thinking about that. Yeah, so I, I, I think in the most uh, um, basic sense, uh, what we've defined as a Department of Defense is that the space domain begins 100 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. And that's where the area of responsibility, the AOR, a formal term in our doctrine of United States Space Command begins. And there is no um, end limit uh, right now. So <laughs> it, it extends upwards indefinitely away from the earth. Um, and so uh, I, I think that's the short answer to that question. Uh, what, what it leads to though is a discussion of, and, and, the, net, and the need to, uh, work uh, integrate caref uh, closely with commanders, uh, other combatant commanders that are, have uh, areas of responsibility that cover the surface of the earth up to that 100 kilometers and to ensure that there is seamless all domain operations uh, in a supporting and supported nature uh, between all of those combatant commanders. 
Um, I guess I could get a little nerdy and say, why 100 kilometers? And I think the best, uh, the best answer I have is that's the, von, the old von Karman line, uh, where the um, amount of speed necessary for an aircraft to generate lift is actually greater than orbital velocity. So it's a nice physical limit uh, and boundary that we find that separates the atmosphere from orbital activity. And, and no, it's it, actually, I was going to ask you to follow up with that exact same thing. Um, just uh, the supported supporting, again, uh, for the listeners that are not deeply versed in, in, in sort of the, the military lingo, can you talk about what that means? And, and I noticed there was recently another uh, new update to the UCP and sort of this broader question of how U.S. Space Command interacts with the other combatant commands. Yeah, so, I, so if we go to when, you know, before space became a warfighting domain, when it was a benign domain, and that was most of my career, by the way, it, our focus in space was to make sure we delivered effects to warfighters in the terrestrial spheres and domains and, and ensure that they got the best possible uh, GPS or the best possible SATCOM, the best possible missile warning that they could possibly get. It was all about supporting terrestrial activity and terrestrial uh, uh, war fighting operations. But now that space is a contested domain, that it is a war fighting domain, uh, a war could uh, extend or even begin in space, in which case there may be a need for commanders in the terrestrial spheres to support General Dickinson in the space domain. Uh, for example, if there was a uh, a, an, an adversary naval vessel that was uh, sending uh, electromagnetic jamming uh, from that vessel into space, and it was affecting our ability to do command and control, um, there might be a need for the geographic commander of that area where that adversary vessel is to maybe um, uh, take care of that problem in support of continuing operations within the space domain. So this idea, this is, this is new, and this is what uh, we are going to have to work very hard on as a Department of Defense moving forward, is how do we conduct all domain operations effectively in a what I see as a continually uh, dynamic supporting and supported uh, relationship all the time. It'll be, it'll be uh, working in multiple ways simultaneously. Got it. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to... Uh, ask the, uh, uh, this is open to all of you. Um, the, the, the top rated question right now is why the establishment of, uh, uh, of military space forces by Russia and China is, is generally perceived as threatening, but maybe, well, why not the, the, the other countries as, as your four countries, others also created their own space forces. Why, why would there be a perception of one is threatening and one is not? Can, does anybody want to try and uh, try and address that at all? Um, I would say, uh, I would say that it's not the fact in itself that we have space forces or space commands, which is, uh, concerning. It is, it is what you do with this. Uh, it's not the fact of having some space objects in space or ready to go in space, which is concerning. It is what you do with it, what you what you what you show as intense or 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 you know your or, or what you want to, to show with this. And uh, so this is actually what is concerning about some uh, some actors in space. And this is the reason why we we have to be ready to. You know, nobody has interest in any conflict in space. So, uh, but we have to be ready. And, and, and John Shaw said, said that very clearly in the introduction. So if you do the, you know, the, the parallel with the, uh, the maritime domain, it's not because you have a Navy that you want war at sea. It's not because you have space force or space command that you want war in space. So it's basically the same. Mm -hmm. um, anyone else? So, so, so that, that sort of, oh, sorry, General Shaw. Yeah, I, uh, so I, I think a, a, a great question. I, I think when, again, I'll go back to when historians write the development of, of space, uh, uh, space forces and um, in history, it, it will point to the fact that what we have done is in response to threats that we saw. Uh, we had uh, 
space, we were using space capabilities again in a benign domain to support warfighting operations uh, uh, on the planet. Uh, and it was steps taken by other actors to threaten those space capabilities that resulted in making it a warfighting domain and it resulted in what we have now done. I, I think I would add that um, the idea here is, uh, is to now protect and defend our space capabilities and provide security so that we deter uh, any kind of threat, uh, threat activity and any counter space activity. I, I think our potential adversaries have seen uh, that in order to fight, to, to conduct modern warfare today, you need space capabilities. And so they are now threatening those space capabilities. And our ultimate goal here, and you know, my highest hope would be that by making our space capabilities more resilient and deterring attacks on them, that we not only deter a war in space, we deter a war, period. General Robinson. Sure, and I'll, I'll, I'll sort of pile on, I guess, to, uh, to General Shaw's comments as well. And I think from a Canadian context, um, where you've got a, a domain such as space um, and, and a significant overlap in our um, military and civil and commercial space enterprises, um, where we've got perhaps uh, multiple utilities for a platform, and I'll use uh, Earth observation for an example, um, you know, there's obviously military application to that, but as we see, increased incidences of, um, of natural disasters, fires, floods, ice storms, and those kinds of things, you know, protecting those assets and protecting those capabilities and ensuring that uh, we have the ability to provide that service uh, to the Canadian public or to, uh, to our allies as well as critically important. And so there becomes this sort of blurring of the lines perhaps between military capability and civil commercial capability when you've, when you've got these platforms um, and it is inherent upon a government to make sure that they can protect uh, their assets and their interests and assure freedom of maneuver within that domain as well. And so I think that becomes critically important. Uh, and then for like a country of, like Canada, um, the protect and defend aspects that General Shaw mentioned really uh, comes from uh, strong alliances uh, that provide that resilience and redundancy in the domain itself. So just to pick up on that, that the deterrence issue, which I think has just come up a, a couple of different times, um, in other domains, the deterrence, look, deterrence is not a unique to space. It's a, a concept that's, that's been around for quite a long time in terms of military op operations and, and perceptions of, uh, of force. Um, generally, there are sort of two ways to approach that. Um, one is deterrence by threat of reprisal. A second is deterrence by denying potential benefits through resilience. Um, if this is for, for anyone, uh, you know, how is that, are, do you, are you approaching that in, in the space domain? Do you see spaces like the nuclear domain where, where, where the main aspect of deterrence is, is the threat of, 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 of reprisal, of return attack, or, or is, it, is it more of a, a denial of benefits uh, resilience approach uh, to, to kind of securing that deterrence? General Shaw? Okay, I'll go ahead. <laughs> uh, so um, first, I think I would answer that by saying the, the, the biggest uh, uh, challenge we have right now is protecting and defending capabilities that were built for a benign domain. And so the focus has to be on making those more resilient so they are there for the warfighter and they are not an easy target. Uh, I've, you know, our, our our space capabilities were built, uh, I, the analogy I've used is our, our satellites at geosynchronous orbit built during the 1990s and early 2000s are analogous to super tankers or mega container ships on the high seas. They were built for efficiency. They were not built to be resilient against threats. I'm not sure I would want to be on the bridge of a super tanker that's under threat of under torpedo attack. And so that is really the big challenge we have right now is how do we take what is a currently an architecture that is not very resilient, that is seen as vulnerable, and now protect it, deter attacks against it, make it more resilient. And it may start with some resilience at the platform level, but it extends to resilience at the architectural level and, and move in that direction first. So that I think is our most uh, near-term challenge that we're working on. Got it. And so, yeah, General Friedman, yes. Uh, I, I would add, if I may, uh, 
So the uh, so obviously I fully agree with John Shaw about the uh, architecture. We have to think about new architectures for the future to improve resilience. But the other point is is probably uh, alliances, partnerships, uh, and and we come to the point of the coalition working together. We uh, even today, we improve the resilience of our uh, space capabilities, and this is uh, and this is one of, of of our great and I would say strategic advantage uh, uh, compared to some other countries that are quite alone in space. Thank you. Um, so, so uh, I think I think part of that, and it's become a couple times before, is better awareness about what's happening in the space domain to help both detect those threats and, and figure out what, what to do about them. Um, and, and this was, you know, previously space, when I was in it was space situation awareness, it's now space domain awareness. Um, can I ask each of you to kind of talk about what's been happening in your country uh, to, to kind of, you know, improve space domain awareness. I think General Sakanashi, I'd like to start with you, because uh, I, I think J Japan of these four countries are probably the newest to that particular domain. Um, but there's also been significant changes recently about what Japan is doing for space situation awareness. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? And so uh, in Japan, uh, for years, uh, the Japan, uh, Japan Aerospace uh, Exploration Agency uh, uh, has been uh, conduct, conducted uh, the SSA mission for uh, civil uh, space purpose. And uh, then uh, we now we have a government plan to uh, to uh, enhance uh, uh, the national SSA capability uh, uh, in a, a follow follow government manner. So uh, so uh, we uh, plan we have plan to uh, uh, establish a new uh, SSA system. The, uh, which is a, a kind of a combined uh, uh, interagency system. The uh, one party is uh, JAXA, the, the other party is the uh, uh, Ministry of Defense, Kokujietai, uh, uh, SF Defense Force. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, we, we now uh, 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 um, uh, promoting uh, the programs about uh, the SSA system uh, in uh, each uh, agency. Uh, so uh, 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 we're hoping that uh, uh, cost effective uh, uh, SSA system uh, capability. Okay, thank you. Um, General Adamson, you mentioned Sapphire before. Uh, can you expand a little what, what Sapphire is and sort of all the ways that, that Canada has been working on space domain awareness? Right, so uh, Sapphire was, uh, launched, I don't know the exact date, uh, but uh, is, is, is currently uh, extended beyond its, its, or is operating beyond its expected life expectancy uh, um, and, and actually doing quite well for us. Um, but obviously um, that's contributing to, uh, to a more larger alliance awareness of, of space uh, domain and, and what's going on there. Um, acknowledging the fact that uh, Sapphire uh, is certainly not going to be a platform that lasts forever um, within our uh, procurement um, practices, we've got Surveillance of Space 2, which is a program that is moving forward. Um, I, I think we've seen that uh, Canada can sort of find some perhaps uh, niche areas that we have uh, both the uh, civil and commercial expertise to, uh, to contribute to this kind of thing. And I believe that uh, Surveillance of Space is one of those areas. So moving forward with a follow-on platform in uh, Surveillance of Space 2 is going to continue our contribution to uh, Alliance awareness of what's going on. Um, you know, at the moment, the proposal is going to be a, a combination, uh, likely of both space-based and ground-based assets uh, that will provide that. Um, and of course, for us, then uh, we feed into CSPO and our partners and, and contribute to their overall awareness of what's going on in the domain. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we're not uh, riding coattails. We want to make sure that we're a, you know, a contributor to what's happening um, and, and uh, maintain our, our place at the table. So that's our plan moving forward. Great, John. General Friedley? Okay, uh, so we we already have, a, I would say, a significant capability in terms of uh, space surveillance in France. We have different kind of radars. Uh, one of them is named GRAV and is in charge of uh, um, watching the uh, the uh, low orbits. 
Uh, we have uh, data from different telescopes, optical uh, data from, from telescope for uh, uh, different orbits. And uh, so I would say this is a significant, but not a sufficient capability. And, uh, and definitely uh, we intend to uh, improve this capability in the next years. And we are working already on this. Uh, we want much more, much more data from, from uh, uh, I would say state-owned um, capabilities, and we intend to replace the, uh, the the radars I mentioned before. And we tend to buy some data uh, of different nature uh, from, uh, or I would say, two uh, two trusted operators. And uh, because we definitely need this huge amount of data uh, for, of different nature, and coming from different places around the world and different uh, uh, sensors and uh, to build a consistent and, and efficient space situation. And, and actually, uh, w one of the points is that uh, this amount of data that we need is, is really a huge amount of data. So one of the questions we address not right now with the, uh, the industry, with the space, uh, French Space Agency and with the French DGA is how we handle this amount of data. So, and there are questions like, uh, you know, the uh, AI and, and, you know, so, uh, so um, uh, fancy questions like this that we have to address uh, in, the, in the next days, weeks and months. Uh, and, uh, and, though, uh, and so we have very interesting, fascinating discussions about this. Uh, just a, a quick follow up on that. Um, there's also a European Union space surveillance and tracking initiative um, can you talk about, about what role France plays in that and, and where the EU SST program may be going in the future? Yeah, uh, EU SST is, is, you know, uh, I would say a combination of, uh, uh, of nations on a volunteer basis. So, uh, so right now we have eight nations uh, contributing to this, uh, to this uh, initiative. And these nations are trying to put together all the capabilities that they have in terms of space surveillance and trying to build a service uh, 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 given to the, to the European uh, uh, Union and the, the countries of Europe in terms of space surveillance, space avoidance, collision avoidance. But it is based, again, on uh, you know, the contribution of uh, some nations of Europe. And uh, so there are progress that have been made uh, and I would say uh, that uh, we have to uh, to wait a little bit more to see whether we can reach a very satisfying uh, level of efficiency. Right. Um, and General Shaw, I mean the US military has sort of long been sort of the the, the goal po or sorry, the goals when it comes to providing uh, space domain awareness uh, but also there's been a lot of change recently. I think some new centers coming online and and also changes in terms of the, the data sharing agreements. Can you talk a little bit about those, please? Sure, I mean, uh, uh, a you know, subject all by itself, right? I think General Friedling is exactly on, on I, I agree with them 100%, that this is, in the end, space situation awareness and space domain awareness are a team effort. And it is a big data problem. If ever there was a big data problem, it's understand, it's the, the tyranny of volume that we need to understand what's going on in the space domain and taking all possible data from all possible sensors and fusing that to develop a picture of what is going on. And I'll just briefly point out, every nation represented in this panel, we're working together on this. We routinely are talking with the Canadian Space Operations Center and the French Space Operations Center about what's going on in space. And, uh, and, and uh, we are, as, I think, as, General Sakanashi could, could uh, uh, affirm we are working with Japan on putting a space situation awareness sensor on their QZSS uh, constellation of satellites. That's a teaming effort there. I think there'll be more teamwork to go. And I could go on and on, but just, just to point out that everybody on this panel, we're working with them. It is a team effort. I'll, I'll broaden the discussion a bit, um, Brian, and say that the, uh, the, um, uh, we have a Space Policy Directive 3 on the current administration that directs that space traffic management move to the Department of Commerce. And I'd, well, I had mentioned that earlier in this, uh, in this session. And so what we're, tr what we're growing to is a distinction between the general understanding of what's going on in space to support safe uh, uh, operations 
Uh, and that would be more, I think, in space situation awareness and space traffic management. It's analogous to what we have in the air domain or the maritime domain to ensure uh, safe uh, uh, operations, uh, to minimize the chance of an accident. Space domain awareness at the other at a, is a different part of the spectrum, and that's to make sure that we can rapidly identify and characterize threats in the domain. And again, that's analogous to domain awareness in the air and maritime domains as well. And I think you will see some some differentiation between those as we move, move forward. And to this point uh, in our history, the Department of Defense has really kind of done all of that. Uh, and that's just how we grew up. We grew up uh, when we started in space with the Department of Defense having the sensors and the ability to understand what's going on in space. But we're now, I think, at an inflection point where the Department of Defense needs to move more towards space domain awareness and understanding threats and we would let, uh, and then Department of Commerce is probably the, the is the better uh, organization from a core confidence perspective to conduct space traffic management. And how we do that, not only within our government, but with our partners will be a, a major effort moving forward. And just to, to tie to that, one of the questions from the audience here is uh, about transparency. Yesterday there, we had a lot of discussions about orbital debris and the need for kind of more public information and more sharing and transparency with what's going on. Do you see that as, as a challenge for the militaries? Uh, you know, how, how do you see this, the, this tension between trying to, you know, protect information about, about military activities in space or, or national security activities in space and the need for more kind of just knowledge about what's going on to protect that safety mission that you mentioned? Yeah, again, I will, I will point to analogy in other domains. Uh, in the maritime domain, the United States Navy, the United States Coast Guard providing security in that domain do participate in making sure that they are, are, um, are, are uh, avoiding possible accidental collisions um, and are part of a maritime domain awareness picture. And so I think the same will happen in the space domain as well. Got it. Um, anyone else uh, want, want to remark on the, the transparency question at all? I'll just add in that I, I believe it's absolutely critical that, uh, you know, that we do share that information. Obviously, um, whether it be debris or what have you is, is not just a threat to military assets, but to commercial and then civil assets as well. Um, you know, within the Canadian context, um, you know, we're looking at uh, making sure that we have a, a commercial integration cell within our CANSPOC that will allow us to maintain those lines of communication, both with uh, commercial operators and with um, Canadian Space Agency to make sure that, you know, if we view a potential conjunction or are there other issues of concern that, uh, you know, that information is passed to those that, uh, that most need it uh, to ensure they have continued operations and aren't necessarily uh, threatened by something they're not even tracking. So. General Friedling. Yeah, I, I would add to some, to some extent that the French space defense strategy is, is, is a first step in terms of uh, um, transparency because uh, in this uh, space defense strategy, we, we, we are saying exactly what we want to do and, and we will do exactly what, what we said. So it's, it's, it's not an issue for us, transparency. I, need, I think we all need transparency in space. And and uh, and what we did with this strategy is 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 I would say I don't like to be you know the, the French arrogant panelist but but it's a kind of it's a kind of a unique uh, situation in which uh, we again we say exactly what we're going to do uh, we are saying exactly what we're going to do and and we will do it and uh, this is not the case of uh, many other actors in space and I think that uh, that also gets a bit more to the. The, the, the question we talked about uh, a few minutes ago, which is, you know, this perception of, of threat. And, and I think that may be part of it, right, is if, you know, you put out more public statements on policy and on, on doctrine and on intent and then see how actions line up to that, as you said, you know, that that, that could go a long way to, to kind of, you know, is what is being done matching what is being said, I think. Uh, I want to pick up on something that, that General Adams has talked about, that's sort of the, the conjunctions, which are close approaches in space, and also bring in a, a question from the audience here um, about the, the conjunction between military assets and civilian assets. Uh, and, you know, we, you, you know, made a couple different analogies to the high seas, to the airspace, where there are existing traffic rules for how ships and aircraft interact, um, those are largely missing at the moment when it comes to space. 
So, uh, you know, any thoughts or, or, or about how about this issue of, you know, should military assets have a right of way when it, when it comes to close approaches um, or, or how just in general, how we get from the current state, which is um, there's not a lot of established rules or, or established norms of behavior to one where we have a little more of that for space. And it, it's open to anyone. Okay. General, yes. uh, so I'm going to be the first. Uh, I, I think the question that you you, you raise uh, here is the question of the of the, the the responsible behaviors in space, and, and this is a, 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 a crucial question, and and this is a difficult question actually, and uh, and this is one of the questions we address in the CISPO initiatives, and and and. And this is the, one of the reasons why this initiative is is very very important because we can we can have this uh, this discussion uh, as a seven nation you know uh, group and and we can try to uh, then uh, explain uh, in other uh, you know arenas uh, what we think uh, we we have to promote as uh, responsible behaviors and and, uh, and that. That is uh, that is the I mean the thing I think sorry the uh, the most important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, so General Shaw, yeah, I, I again I think I agree 100% with uh, General Friedling there. I, um, I I think we start from uh, responsible behaviors and safe uh, behaviors are, are good are, are the best place to start as we move forward in this discussion. As I mentioned before, we're, we continue to see more and more kinds of activities in space. Uh, we haven't yet talked about it in this session, but I know you must have in the, in the overall space sustainability uh, event here about the, prolifer the potential proliferation in low Earth orbit of commercial satellites. Um, in some ways, that might be the greatest threat that we have to space sustainability if we, uh, as, a, as, a, as a planet, don't do that properly, don't have way, uh, expectations and norms on how to properly dispose of those capabilities, um, how to properly, uh, 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 for, for the operators of those mega constellations to provide as much information as they can on, on how those, uh, those capabilities are maneuvering and, and such. Uh, I'll throw another, uh, you know, we will see more and more um, academic uh, platforms in space, small CubeSats and such that probably aren't maneuverable. We need to think about Kind of, and if they're the guidelines and responsible design for those capabilities so that we don't become a navigational hazard. And so I think it starts with that as we expand the, uh, as we continue to expand across all sectors, our presence in space, how do we do that in a responsible way? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so just to tie into that, you mentioned the commercial. We haven't really talked about it yet either. Uh, we talked at the very beginning about how one of the big changes happening now in the space domain is the emergence and growth of the commercial sector. Um, how do you see that from a military standpoint? Is that, is, is that something you think is going to help the, the deterrence and, and trying to increase resilience? Um, do, or, or is there other ways you're sort of looking at the role of the commercial sector in, in terms of space activities? Yeah, for anyone. Yeah, General Sakanashi. Uh, I think uh, the uh, growing the commercial uh, space capability and uh, uh, space uh, technology uh, is a very good uh, chance opportunity to enhance uh, the military uh, capability in a very uh, cost-effective manner. Uh, so uh, uh, we can uh, utilize such a uh, uh, commercial capability to to not only uh, enhance our capability, but also uh, to lengthen our uh, resiliency. Uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, uh, growing a commercial space is a good news for us. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, General Anderson. Yeah, I think the uh, I think the, the comments that have been made on, on responsible behaviors are absolutely critical. Um, but uh, you know, those discussions happen at a national level, um, and certainly signatories uh, would be governmental on something like that. Um, obviously, we you want to uh, talk the talk, you want to walk the walk as well, and set the example. And, and I think uh, our alliance partners are, are the kind of uh, 
partners that, that would do that. Um, the proliferation of commercial satellites raises another issue because now you've got to um, have commercial entities and, and private industry and business uh, on board with responsible behaviors as well. And, and how, do you, how do you enforce that? How do you um, maintain the, uh, the integrity of, of what you're trying to accomplish in that regard, um, perhaps when there's a, a business model that doesn't necessarily subscribe to responsible behaviors? And I, I think that raises a whole host of other issues that are probably worthy of a further conversation, but something I thought I'd raise. No, it's, it's an excellent point. And you know, that, that was actually something we, we, we talked about yesterday a bit was uh, there are actually some um, some private sector initiatives to develop res best practices, responsible behaviors. There's a, a space safety coalition of 40 some operators that has put out uh, some, a list of, of res behaviors that they pledged to, 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 uh, to abide by. There's been some discussion of um, ways to incentivize either, you know, a carrot or a horse stick approach, commercial behavior. Um, but it's, I wouldn't say it's not widespread yet. And, and, and there's still a lot of that is still sort of in, in the nascent areas. Um, going back to a little bit more national security focus of this question, um, you know, let's say in, in the future, uh, militaries are using a commercial capability, let's say, to augment uh, remote sensing or like, augment communications. Um, in that then, and then, then a, and a conflict happens, um, how do you see that role of the military in protecting commercial? Is it um, only those that you're directly using, or, or do you think that there's a maybe a, a, such on the high seas a broader role for the military uh, in, in protecting commercial industry and sort of commerce in space? Any, any thoughts on that at all? Um, that, that's uh, yeah. I tried to give you a beginning of an answer. Um, this is, uh, you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, uh, the Shriver war game, and this is one of the uh, issues that we addressed uh, in the recent uh, Shriver war game. So how do we, uh, how do we coordinate with the, the private uh, actors in space? Uh, do they want to be protected or escorted or whatever? Um, and, and this was very interesting last time, actually, we, we attended a Shri War Game because, you know, the opinions or, or the uh, views of the different uh, private players in the room, they were very different. And then, so I think we are at the beginning of the story right now here because we, we are uh, still discovering the challenges, the threats and how to handle them and the norms of behavior and whatever. And, and and you know, I, I like to say that uh, it's it's kind of what happened in the First World War, where you know uh, appeared the, uh, the the submarines, the first submarines, who attacked the you know the private the uh, the the ships uh, on in the ocean, and uh, and 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 then we at the beginning very rapidly actually the these uh, boats these ships uh, on on the uh, ocean atlantic ocean they they wanted to be escorted by by the allies because because they were at risk at the beginning they didn't want to because uh, uh, it was uh, it, 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 they had too many constraints i would say but uh, but rapidly uh, they were uh, you know uh, they were in kind of convoys escorted and to protect them from the from the threats and and i think uh, we have a kind of uh, parallel here for the future, and we don't think about. Yeah, you know, I, I realize this is a, is a sort of the theme of our discussion today has been we are at the beginning of a, of a significant change in the space domain, and there's a lot of questions of of doctrine and policy that are still being sorted out, and I, I think that's a. Uh, an excellent sort of uh, uh, framing of, of how to, to think about the answer. And also, I think it's an important point. Uh, you know, I've seen it myself. Uh, we've had some discussions with industry on this topic, and there's not a universal perspective on on how they view the the potential interactions with the military and, and potential directing things. So um, we've got about eight minutes left uh, before we go ahead and wrap up today. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and try and get through as many of the remaining um, questions again. Um, uh, and, and sort of, uh, General Shaw, a question for you that's uh, the most highly rated one I should ask at the moment. Um, it, it relates to actually this afternoon's panel on system interactivities. 
Uh, and that is, what is the role the Space Force will have, or do you think might have, in cislunar and, and lunar operations, particularly stability and security standpoint? Yeah, I'll start uh, more, let me, more broadly, the last couple of questions about um, this, this uh, as more commercial activity happens in space, that is wonderful. I mean, that contributes to economic prosperity for our nation, for our allies, for the globe. Uh, and again, it's analogous to other domains, right? So we just need to do it right. How do we, how do, we do it right so it's sustainable and further economic investment is, is, uh, is um, incentivized? And I think the Department of Defense does have a role in that regard, and it begins with transparency and understanding what's happening in the domain, and then uh, security against potential threats. And that will evolve over time. Again, it shouldn't be anything new to us. We've seen this in other domains. With regard to CISLUNAR, it's inevitable uh, that we are going to have to, you know, right now our, we have set our, our event horizon that we look at into space pretty much at the geosynchronous uh, uh, orbit. And we've just done that traditionally because that's where the bulk of the activity in whatever sector, national security, uh, commercial, civil has, has kind of peaked out. While it's going to expand, we will see more uh, activity beyond the geosynchronous sphere out to the cislunar sphere, and the Department of Defense, the United States Space Force, United States Space Command have to keep pace. And leading that charge will be space domain awareness out to the cislunar sphere to understand what's going on there, what potential navigation hazards there could be, uh, and again, providing a, 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 a security uh, mechanism for other actors uh, that want that are venturing into that uh, that realm, and, and all those lines. Probably, uh, I think maybe also extending that space domain awareness out probably to the cislunar sphere. Is that part of it as well? So a absolutely, absolutely. You know, there are already uh, platforms operating well beyond the geosynchronous uh, um, orbit. Uh, they're mostly exploration platforms, uh, but we'll see more uh, communications platforms as NASA. Uh, you know, advances the Artemis uh, program and the Gateway initiative. Uh, we'll probably team with them in some regard with regard to space domain awareness, space situation awareness in the lunar sphere and communications networks. It's inevitable that we'll be part of that progression. We just need to anticipate that. Yeah. And, and just to, to make it specifically clear, unlike the TV show Space Force, Space Force is not the entity leading the return to the moon. Uh, that That is still going to maintain a civil thing. And any kind of, you know, human military presence is probably going to be a little ways off, if I understand things. Yeah, I, I, I just, yeah, you're absolutely right, Brian. Um, I've, I've said before, the United States Space Force will not be putting humans into space for national security purposes anytime soon. I think it will eventually, but not anytime soon. We are going to rely on, as General Friedling mentioned earlier, on, uh, on, on advanced uh, machines, uh, artificial intelligence, and such to do those missions with the humans of Space Force, commanding and controlling and making the key decisions to operate those capabilities here on the planet. Uh, General Sakana, thank you. General Sakanashi, um, there's a question here about how the establishment of the space domain mission unit um, uh, meets with the historical j concerns about Japan space being peaceful in nature, the military space activities. Um, so I guess, if I could raise, you talk a little bit about how the the framing of military space in Japan has changed over the last few years, and, and what it is the space domain unit that is now doing in space. Is it is it more awareness um, of, of space? What sort of activities do you envision them doing? Uh, uh, oh. Uh, in uh, uh, all uh, the Japanese uh, the defense program is uh, st structurally under uh, the uh, Japanese uh, peaceful policy, and uh, uh, so uh, uh, our the space domain unit, the uh, space operations unit uh, squadron, uh, the mission is uh, uh, just for uh, acquiring uh, the awareness, the space station awareness. Uh, uh, because of the importance of the space uh, uh, assets for uh, not only national security, but also the uh, economy or uh, uh, as, as, uh, people's uh, daily life. 
Uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, I don't, I don't think any uh, uh, di dilemma uh, uh, between the uh, the uh, building the space uh, capability in uh, self defense force and uh, uh, our uh, uh, our long long term the uh, peaceful uh, policy. Great. Um, um, sorry, General Friedling, a follow-up question to you. Um, uh, their question was, you, you mentioned the NATO Center of Excellence for Space. Um, it, it, has that decision already been made uh, to put that in Toulouse, or is that still ongoing? Well, it's uh, still ongoing. We, there, there are two different proposals to NATO from two different countries. And, uh, and, and these uh, proposals are of a different nature. One is a dedicated center to this new domain, and one is a, a branch of an existing center dedicated to space. This is, uh, this is really different. And this is uh, the reason why we think uh, our proposal is, is, uh, is of uh, the best value for NATO. But this is ongoing to answer your question. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Um, so it's a question to everybody. This is actually at the moment, the, uh, we've answered a couple of the other top rated questions. So the new top rated question um, is about how we live up to the statement that General Shaw said earlier about nobody wants to have a war in, in space. Um, what can you, can each of you or, or any of you talk about how what you're doing, what your military is doing in space, um, can be shaped to helping deter and prevent conflict, as opposed to perhaps uh, uh, being interpreted as something that is that is aggressive that might lead to conflict. Um, how, how how are you thinking about this uh, in, in, in this new expansion of military activities in a way that is going to try and uh, hopefully prevent conflict in space? Um, General Shaw, you mind going first on that? Yeah, I'll just give a real quick answer. You know, pretty much any domain in human history from a military perspective you look at, um, you invite uh, conflict when, when, you, uh, when there's weakness, and I believe you deter conflict when there is strength. And so that is the path we're on. We are going to become more resilient. We're going to protect and defend our capabilities in space, and that will lead us, I believe, to a... a, a a more strategically stable situation that deters conflict in space. Great, uh, thank you for that. Any, anyone else like to join in on that? Sure, I'll, I'll echo General Shaw's comments. I think that's, uh, that's well put, and I think that strength comes from certainly uh, shared, uh, like-minded countries, uh, you know, collaborating, forming alliances, whether it be, uh, you know, within NATO, whether it be CISPO or, or beyond all of that. And I think setting a good example through, uh, you know, adopting best principles and best practices in, in a commons domain uh, that sets the example and, and raises the bar in terms of expected behaviors for all participants is certainly the way to go. Um, you know, and, and certainly Canada is, is going along those lines as well and working with our partners and, and promoting those behaviors and those responsible behaviors. So, uh, yeah, I think that's the way to go for sure. Okay. All right. General Friedling, one final comment? Uh, final, I don't know, but, but uh, I would say nothing better than, than General Shaw. And uh, but just want to add that there is a very old Latin, uh, you know, proverb uh, that all of you probably know, which is a siwis pacem parabellum. So, okay, so if you want peace, just be prepared to, to war and, and you have peace then. Okay. Um, with that, um, Thank you all uh, for participating in the discussion. I thought it was very great, uh, particularly since General Shaw was a very early start for you today. And General Sakanashi, it's a uh, very late at night. So thank you very much uh, for, for being up with us. Um, I wish we could do this in person so you could hear the, the thunderous round of applause from the 250 or so participants that are currently listening on, but we cannot. So uh, uh, thank you again.